Hi, my name is Eric Wilson. I decided to wear a suit and tie today because that's what Jehovah's Witnesses do when they stand on the platform giving a talk, and essentially I'm giving a talk. So I thought I'd go with the customary form of dress, even though I hate ties. I think most of us do. You get to a certain age, you don't want anything restricting the flow of blood to your brain. And after all, it was in invented by the French as part of a military uniform, so you've got to factor that in. But anyways, here I am to talk about Matthew 24, 34. Now, in our last video, we analyzed uh, the current understanding of Jehovah's Witnesses of the overlapping generations. And um, we analyzed two ways of studying. One was eisegesis and one was exegesis. Eisegesis was where you read interpretations of men into the text, and we determined that's exactly what was has been done and is being done with the overlapping generations doctrine. Kind of eisegesis on steroids, really. Anyway, now we're going to do it the right way. And it's interesting that uh, David Splane acknowledges this is the right way in a, in a video, one of the videos on the history of, of uh, Jehovah's Witnesses. Let me just play that for you. Henry grew. By 1807, at age 25, Grew was invited to serve as pastor of the Baptist Church in Hartford, Connecticut. And he had a very interesting philosophy on the study of the Bible. Let Scripture interpret Scripture. Grew's point was that the Bible was its own best interpreter. So the way he words that, you think, oh, well, that's the way we do it. That's the way we uh, study the Bible. And I'm sure we all thought that. I certainly did. But we're going to apply exegetical uh, study, which is exactly what he's describing, letting the Bible speak for itself. We're going to apply that to Matthew 24, 34. And I'll tell you right up front, one thing we're going to learn is that there is no modern day application. Now, you're probably thinking, but how could there not be any modern-day application? How will we know how close the end is? Because we've been brought up with the idea that we can know how close the end is, right? And, and it kind of scares us if we don't know. I mean, then we could say the end could be 50 years away or 100 years away. Well, we've got to accept what the Bible teaches. There's nothing else we can do. And here's the thing. Do we think we're smarter than God? You see... I'm going to read you a scripture from Acts 1, 6 and 7. Now, this is where the apostles, they were very concerned about what the end would come. They'd already asked Jesus uh, about the sign, which is what Matthew 24 is about to a great extent. But 40 days later, Jesus is ascending to heaven, and they want more information, which is you know typical and normal, I think, for humans. So they come to him and they say... In, Verse 6. So when they had assembled, they asked him, Lord, are you restoring the kingdom of Israel at this time? Now, the kingdom of Israel is the Davidic kingdom, where again a king would sit on the throne and rule over Israel, which is exactly what Jesus does. He is the Davidic king, and when he assumes power over the kingdom of God, it is the kingdom of Israel, but in an extended way. This is something we all accept. So they're asking him, essentially, when are you coming back? When is your presence? When is your rule going to begin? What does he say? He said to them, and this is seven, it does not belong to you to know the times or seasons that the Father has placed in his own jurisdiction. It does not belong to you to know. None of your business is essentially what he's saying. So how can we know then? And he'd already told them something similar. Maybe it didn't quite penetrate. So let's go back to Matthew 24. Forty days earlier, they'd asked him the question about when he'd be coming back and when all these things would be. And in verse 42 of Matthew 24, he says, Keep on the watch, therefore, because you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. You do not know on what day. Okay, but we could say, well, yeah, but maybe we can know the year. 
or the approximate decade. But then he adds in 44, just to make sure we got the point, on this account, you too prove yourselves ready because the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not think to be it. You do not think to be it. So, the times and the seasons, not in our jurisdiction. Uh, the day and when he's coming and the time when he's coming will be at a time when we actually think he's not coming. Okay. But then, just a few verses earlier in Matthew 24, he says this. Let's go to uh, 32. Now learn this illustration from the fig tree. Just as soon as its young branch grows tender and sprouts its leaves, you know that summer is near. Likewise also you, when you see all these things, know that he is near at the doors. Truly I say to you that this generation will by no means pass away until all these things happen. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. That sounds like a contradiction to me. Doesn't it sound like that to you? He tells them it doesn't belong to you to know the times and the seasons. Summer is a season. Then he uses the season to illustrate how they will know that he is near at the doors. And he says, I'm coming at a time you think it not to be. Well, if I see leaves sprouting, I think, hey, summer's near. I'm expecting summer to come. So when summer comes, I can say it came at a time I expected it to be. However, if the leaves sprout and winter comes, that catches me off guard. I'm not expecting that. Well, he's saying, I'm coming at a time you think it not to be. And yet he's saying, look at the leaves. When they change, you know summer's near. Therefore, when you see all these things, you will know that he's near at the doors. It sounds like an utter contradiction. Now, Jesus cannot contradict himself. That's a given. Therefore, something is wrong with our reasoning. And remember when we talked earlier in the previous video about exegetical reasoning, we said the thing you have to do is enter the discussion with a clean mind. See, we come into it thinking, okay, now let's find out how the generation applies to our day. And we come into it thinking that everything that's written in Matthew 24 applies to Jesus' presence. We're coming into it with ideas, and that's clouding our thinking, hindering our reasoning. Let's put all that aside. We have a, an apparent contradiction. There cannot be a contradiction, so let's resolve the contradiction. Okay, so we go to Matthew 24, and we're going to read the question they asked him in verse 3. While he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples approached him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your presence and of the conclusion of the system of things. The sign of your presence, the sign of the conclusion of the system of things, and when will all these things be? Three things. Now, were they asking him about his coming? No, they were not asking him about his coming. Well, yes, they were, but not in our sense, not the way we understand it. And that's another aspect of exegesis. You have to go into the mindset of the writer or the audience who's ever asking the question, what was their mindset? What were they thinking? What was their historical context? So to understand that, we have to go back a few days. These men had just spent four days with Jesus. His last four days had been in the temple. And if you read the uh, last, uh, let me think now, it's, yes, it's Matthew 21, 22, and 23. Read those three chapters. And you'll see all he says while in the temple, those four days. And he preaches, he gives many illustrations, he condemns the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the leaders, calls them uh, offspring of vipers, poisonous snakes, um, whitewashed graves, hypocrites repeatedly. I mean, he pulls out all the stops. You can see he's fed up with them. He's given them three and a half years to come around, and they haven't, and now he's just letting them have it. No holds barred. So after that, after those three, four days, now he's reached the time when he's going to be killed. He knows that the next day is his last day. So as he leaves the temple for the last time in verse uh, 33 of chapter 23 of Matthew, 
He says, Serpents, offspring of vipers, how will you flee from the judgment of Gehenna? For this reason I am sending to you prophets and wise men and public instructors. Some of them you will kill and execute on stakes, and some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city, so that there may come upon you all the righteous blood spilled on the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the sanctuary and the altar. Truly I say to you, notice this, all these things will come upon this generation. Okay, so he's making them responsible for all the blood, all the righteous blood spilled, all the blood from the seed of the woman, right back to Abel. Before there was an Israel, long before there was an Israel, they're responsible for all that blood because they are the seed of Satan. He calls them uh, liars, and he says they are basically the children of the, of the lie, the children of Satan. He is the father of the lie. So he's he he's identifying them as the seed of Satan, and all the blood that has been spilled is on their heads. This generation, all these things will come upon this generation. No doubt as to whom he's talking about. The generation are, is the wicked and adulterous generation. And we'll just do a quick little analysis now in the Watchtower Library. Just We'll just stay with Matthew because Mark and Luke support this completely, and you can do your own search, but we want to keep this brief. And you'll find that every time he uses generation, he uses it in the context of this wicked, adulterous, faithless, generation of people. So we're starting in Matthew, and the first occurrence of generation, there are nine occurrences in the book, is negative. It's, he's <clears throat> criticizing those who are criticizing him uh, and John the Baptist. And the next occurrence, we have obviously a wicked and adulterous generation, so that's negative. The men of Nineveh condemn it. The Queen of the South condemns it, so there's three more occurrences. Then now in the fifth occurrence, um, he calls it a wicked generation. In the sixth occurrence, it's a wicked and adulterous generation. And the eighth occurrence, a faithless and twisted generation. Sorry, that was the seventh occurrence. Then in the eighth is the one we've already considered, where he's condemning them because of all the blood they spilled right up to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah. And then in the ninth, the final occurrence, he just says this generation will by no means pass away. So are we to assume that the disciples sat there after three and a half years with Jesus and thought, oh, he doesn't mean the wicked and adulterous generation he's always spoken of. He means something new. He means us. Okay. So there you have it. It's pretty clear. They leave the temple, and he's just spent time telling everybody that the temple's going to be destroyed, Jerusalem's going to be destroyed, and of course, they're not happy about that. Even his disciples, this is their city. This is the city of God, and the temple is the, the temple of God. This is where Jehovah's presence is. This is the only site for pure worship in their minds. There's no other place in all the earth where you can go and worship Jehovah God except in the temple. So how could it be destroyed? So they say to him, look at all the beautiful buildings, Lord. And what does he say in reply? Well, in verse uh, 2 of chapter 24, he says in response, he said to them, do you not see all these things? There's that phrase again. Do you not see all these things? Truly I say to you, by no means will a stone be left here upon a stone and not be thrown down. They leave. They walk out of Jerusalem. They go to the Mount of Olives. They're uh, relaxing there now uh, after a hard day of denunciation. And um, they ask him a question, which has obviously been on their minds. Four of them come forward and say, verse 3, Tell us, when will these things be. He's just said, all these things will come upon this generation. Then he said, you see all these things, they'll be torn down. And now they're asking him, when will these things be? And then when he answers, a little later on in verse 
34, he says, Truly I say to you that this generation will by no means pass away until all these things happen. Is he talking about different things suddenly? Is he talking about a different generation suddenly? Would they sit there and think, oh, he's talking about different things in a different generation? No, the context completely supports the idea that he's talking about the fulfillment of what he just said, the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple, and all these things coming upon this generation, this wicked, adulterous generation. It's the only thing that fits without any conflict. And we'll see why it's important that we understand that to resolve the other conflict of him saying, you won't know when I'm coming. Matter of fact, I'll coming when you don't expect it. And then saying, by the way, use these signs to expect that he's near at the doors. So going back to their question, it's three parts. They thought, this was all concurrent. That's why 40 days later, when they asked him just before he ascended, are you restoring the kingdom of Israel at this time? To them, the restoration of the kingdom of Israel, the destruction of the temple, the destruction of Jerusalem, his presence as king, all of that was a single event, something that would happen altogether. And remember, he told them, it does not belong to you to, you, to know the times and the seasons that the Father has put in his own jurisdiction. So certain times and certain seasons, the father had put in his own jurisdiction. Not all of them, certain ones. And the ones that he put in his own jurisdiction were off limits. So even if Jesus knew about these things, even though he said, I do not know the day or hour when the, when the end comes, even the son didn't know that. But even if he did, he wouldn't be at liberty to tell them. There were things they weren't allowed to know. But there were things they needed to know. Jerusalem was going to be destroyed. And they needed to do something about that. They needed to take positive and affirmative and prompt action. Otherwise, they would be swept away as well. So he had to give them that warning. And at the same time, not let on things they weren't allowed to know. So he didn't say, oh, you're wrong. This question is is actually based on a fault, faulty premise. You see, um, my presence uh, is not linked to all these things I've been talking about, this destruction of Jerusalem. My presence is totally separate. Matter of fact, it'll be 2,000 years in the future. No, he couldn't say any of that. So he gave them the answer they asked for, but left out things that he was not allowed to speak of. So with that in mind, we realize that there's two answers. There's the answer to all these things and the answer to when is your presence going to be. And as for the conclusion of the system of things, they thought it would be the conclusion of the Jewish system of things, which happened in their lifetime, not the conclusion of the system of things uh, that we know of. But we have to remember, exegetically, we're looking at their mindset. What were they thinking? Because it was their question based on what they understood. Okay, so with that in mind, everything starts to make sense. He said in verse 32, Sorry, let's, uh, let's go to 33. Likewise also you, this is after explaining the seasons, when you see all these things, know that he is near at the doors. Well, we jump to the conclusion that he is Jesus. He's speaking about himself in the third person. But is he? Well, in the same uh, speech he makes to them, he tells them in verse 15, Therefore, when you catch sight of the disgusting thing that causes desolation, as spoken about by Daniel the prophet, standing in a holy place, then in parenthesis, well, of course, the parenthesis didn't exist in Greek, but the thought was parenthetical. He says, let the reader use discernment. Now, why would he reference Daniel? And then why would he add that phrase, use discernment? Well, let's go to Daniel and see if Daniel said anything about the destruction of Jerusalem, because what follows, if you read from 16 down to 22, is the destruction of Jerusalem, and he, with very specific instructions. When you see the sign, the disgusting thing that causes desolation, then he said, flee to the mountains in verse 16. Uh, um, if you're on top of the house, don't come down. If you're out in the field, don't come back, verse 17 and 18. Uh, pray that it doesn't occur in the winter, and woe to the nursing women who, uh, if it occurs while they're, you know, 
either pregnant or carrying a child, it would be very difficult because it would be an arduous and rapid journey from not just Jerusalem, but the entire country, out of the country, out of Judea, into the mountains. They'd have to do that, or they'd be de be dead within a few years, which is exactly what happened. In 66 CE, Cestius Gallus came, and that was no surprise. They saw the leaves sprouting, because earlier there had been rebellion in Judea, and the Jews had thrown the Roman garrison out. They had expelled the Romans, freed themselves of the rule of Rome. Well, Rome's not going to take that lying down. I mean, if they let them off the hook, all the other peoples they'd subjugated would want to be off the hook. They'd have world, worldwide rebellion. Their empire spanned the globe at that time, at least the known globe to them. So they had to act, and they did. They sent an army. And for some reason, in 66 CE, that army left and went back to Rome. Now, there's speculation as to why, but the important thing is Jesus foresaw that the days would be cut short, because in verse 22, he says, on account of the chosen ones, those days would be cut short. So there's all these signs, the disgusting thing in the holy place, Rome invading the, the holy place in Jerusalem, and then suddenly it goes. The leaves are sprouting. The Christians would say, aha, time to go. And they did. They ran away. Three and a half years later, Titus comes back. And he destroys the city. Doesn't just conquer it. He destroys it. Now we go to Daniel. We'll look at Daniel 9, verse 26. And after the 62 weeks, Messiah will be cut off with nothing for himself. And the people of a leader who is coming will destroy the city and the holy place. And its end will be by the flood. And until the end, there will be war. What is decided upon is desolations. The leader is he who is near at the gates. That is coming. So when he's talking about know that he is near, when you see the turning of the leaves, he's not talking about himself. He's talking about this leader who turned out to be Titus. When they saw the signs, they would know that he is near. And he was near. He was only three and a half years away. And so if they used discernment, if they read Daniel, they'd say, okay, this is talking about the destruction of the city. And they use the word here, Daniel uses the word flood. Its destruction will be like the flood. Well, there was no flood, right? Not a literal flood. But a flood sweeps everything before it. So in the Bible, sometimes flood is used not in a literal way, but in a figurative way to indicate uh, complete destruction. We know that floodwaters can carry even boulders weighing tons look far downstream. That's the power of water. And so this leader and his people would sweep over the land, would destroy everything, leaving not a stone upon a stone. So there's the fulfillment. So now we can understand that there was no contradiction. He was telling them, this season, the season of the destruction of Jerusalem, is one that you will see coming like you see the leaves sprouting from the trees. And the leader who is going to do it is near at the doors when you see these signs. But then he adds right away, however, as far as me, my presence, the Son of Man, I will be coming at a time you think it not to be. So there's two... Two events. They didn't get that, of course, as indicated by their question 40 days later. Are you restoring the kingdom of Israel at this time? How could he answer that? He told them, I'm coming when you think it not to be. He could hardly say, oh, yes, I am. He would contradict himself. They would understand when the time came, when Jerusalem was destroyed and the Messiah had not appeared and the kingdom of God had not begun, then they would know that that reign, that coming of Christ in kingly power would be at a future time. Now, what about this whole thing about antitypes and types? Well, we've already established that unless it's stated so in the Bible, there is no basis for it. Well, in recent years, the trend in our publications has been to look for the practical application of Bible events and not for types, 
where the scriptures themselves do not clearly identify them as such. We simply cannot go beyond what is written. Well, the one basis was the conclusion that he, he is near at the gates or near at the door was Jesus. Well, we've just established it wasn't Jesus. Uh, the other basis is a very, very thin thread, and that is uh, what Brother Splain uses to establish his understanding. Let's listen to him for a minute. In the same chapter, Jesus talks about a great tribulation. So the generation will not pass away until the great tribulation occurs. Now that is interesting. That is relevant to us. Okay. So he's saying that because the words great tribulation appear here, and because they appear in Revelation, then the two things are connected. So the only connection is that the words are used. However, in Revelation 7.14, the angel says, the great tribulation. He makes it um, special. You can say, a man came, uh, or you can say, the man came. You mean two totally different things. There is only one, the man, in that, in that context, whereas a man could be any man. Here in Matthew, he talks about great tribulation, generically. And it was great tribulation. Again, in Revelation, we find uh, Jesus talking about Jezebel, who was uh, a member of a congregation and was misleading the, the faithful. And he was going to punish her and her followers with great tribulation. Now, we don't say there's a parallel there. We don't say that's an antitype to the type in, uh, in Matthew, because we know it's not. But the same two words are used. So you cannot establish a type and an antitype just because a phrase is used, especially a phrase as common as great tribulation. So there is no basis for an antitypical fulfillment. There's nothing in the Bible to indicate it. But we say, yes, but what about the uh, wars and the reports of wars and all of that? That didn't happen in the first century. They were in the middle of the uh, most peaceful time in human history. It's actually named the Roman peace or the Pax Romana. And it was because Rome was so powerful that it kept all the peoples from warring with one another. So there were no wars and reports of wars in those days, certainly nothing significant. So if it didn't happen in those days, there's no type. And if there's no type, there can be no anti-type. Yes, but Jesus did talk about wars and reports of wars, right? As a sign, as part of the composite sign. We always say the composite sign. Why do we say composite sign? Why don't, why don't we just say signs as part of the signs? We never say that. It's because Jesus didn't say that. If you look at Matthew 24, and we'll go to verse 30. He says, Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and all the tribes of the earth will beat themselves in grief, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Sign. They asked for a sign. He gave them a sign. Well, actually, he gave them two because there were two events. The first sign was the disgusting thing standing in the holy place. But that was for the destruction of Jerusalem. When he talked about himself coming, one sign. And what was it? Him. It was him in the heavens. Basically, he was saying, you'll see me when you see me. And it has to be that way because he said that he's coming at a time we think it not to be. So we cannot have a sign because the sign would tell us that he's about to come and that would invalidate what he said in Matthew 24, 44. It just makes sense, doesn't it? So we have to say composite sign because he said sign and now there's a whole bunch of things we say are part of the sign, uh, which contradicts his words in Matthew 24, 44, but dovetails very nicely in our support for Matthew for 1914. You see, this whole thing, this whole eisegesis or eisegetical application that we give as Jehovah's Witnesses stems from the need to support our understanding of 1914. 
So the question is, why did Jesus say there'd be wars and reports of wars and famines and earthquakes and pestilences? And is 1914 true? And is 1914 signed or, or signaled by the First World War, for example, and the Spanish influenza? Those are all very good questions and more than we can cover here. So in our next video, we're going to talk about 1914. And I hope you'll join me for that because in the words of Brother Splain, it's going to be fun.